Hello everyone, welcome to Wicked West Books. My name is Meg. This is Kestrel, who's become less and less fond of being held, so he will spend most of this video on the floor. But he's got to at least say hello. And this video has been a moment in coming. I meant to only take one week off, and then I got really busy and couldn't find any time to just film an intro and outro for my vlog. So finally we're getting down to it and I should hopefully be back to weekly uploads. So about a month ago already, my absolute favorite author came to Oklahoma City and I got to go and do her book signing. This was especially exciting because she was also the first author to cancel her signings two years ago when the panorama started. But she came back and I am completely grateful. So my husband and I left that morning. We went to Oklahoma City. Our first stop was Barnes & Noble. We didn't buy anything. We just looked around. And then we went to Half Price Books. Who let me into a bookstore? Where we looked at all of the books that they have for sale. We spent a good amount of time there and even more money. We, we did end up spending money here. I will have to do a book haul soon because I've got a lot of books that I've bought and I haven't shown the internet any of them and it's about time for me to do that. So while we were there we also looked at the Patricia Briggs novels that were on sale at Half Price Books because we were going to go and see the author very very soon. We had a couple of hours to kill and we did eat lunch before it all started. Dinner? Something? We had Zorba's. It was Greek food. It's always delicious. And I found two of the UK covers for the Patricia Briggs books that were still on sale. You can see the stickers. I haven't taken them off yet. I will. I absolutely could not resist buying two more books to get signed that are just kind of special copies for me. So I went ahead and picked those up and I brought them with me to the book signing. Now here is some of the conversation that Patricia Briggs had with us, the audience, before she actually went through with the book signing. As you heard earlier, this was supposed to happen in 2020, yeah. and you know, some, something came up, I don't remember what. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I thought, okay, well that'll be the last we see of Miss Briggs, and then here she is, and we are so grateful for her, and grateful for you, and I'm gonna turn it right over to you. Okay. see does this work so usually I start this with a reading but I've given the bookstore my book to help out with the the book shortage so I'm not going to start with a reading which is fine <laughs> which is fine okay okay good it didn't stop um, <laughs> which okay okay wait a minute do you want a reading or would you rather it might, with this microphone it might be better off if I just do a Q&A so Questions. I need to see hands. Right here. Okay, okay, right there. Go ahead. When do we get a love story for Ben? <laughs> when do we get a love story for Ben? A love story for Ben. Ben is so, ben is so broken. <laughs> Sorry. If I were a nice person, I wouldn't write fiction. Um, <laughs> I, it, uh, it'll happen in my head. It'll happen as long as there's world enough in time, but not in soul taken. Okay. 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 Yes. Is Mercy going to have kids? Is Mercy going to have kids? In my head, in which this is a real world. Of course, Mercy and Adam have babies. In my real world, in which I have to write the dang books, I will be. I. I would be really dumb to do that because it would make my life really suck. <laughs> For some characters, it wouldn't matter so much, but Mercy has such abandonment issues. She's never going to leave her kids with a babysitter. She's never going, I mean, if, if she has children, she's gonna have them with her. And half of the, I can, I can write maybe a book or two in which I force her into adventures, but after a while that gets old, and then really what makes the Mercy books work is she jumps into adventures, right? And that's, that's kind of the, um, the way I've kept these books fresh and going. And at, when I give her an excuse not to do that, it's gonna make my life suck. So, um, in my head they have kids, so if that helps all of you, you can, you can go home and be happy, but probably not unless I really hate myself someday. Are they going to do that in the series? Okay, yes. Are you ever gonna explain the chocolate bunny? Am I ever going to explain the chocolate bunny? I do. In Soul Taken, the chocolate bunny incident is explained. Yes. Uh, since I sold 
told them he was no longer taking any dates. Are we going to hear some more about the lady that he has kind of taken a shine to? Yes, and I think a seal is misspoken. <laughs> Because I had this wonderful conversation. I've been worried about that last story. And because I promised that I would do the last story. I've been wondering about it, worried about it. And my daughter happened to ask a driver we had on this trip, what was the most unusual conversation they had under overheard? And they told us. And it was awesome. And I'm totally <laughs> going to use that for <laughs> Are we going to get any more adventures from Hirok? And the answer is uh, yes, if I had whirled enough our time. And what, I, what I've been talking about doing for a number of years now is putting together a bunch of short stories um, that are short stories from my previous series. So from the Sinem series, from the Hirok series, from the Raven series, maybe a, from the Hobbs Bargain, and, and, and then maybe a couple of Mercy Universe stories, short stories put together and put them together because I can probably find time to write a short story. Oh, you bless you. I can follow, she had the dragon, the dragon, bones, dragon bones and dragon blood up there. Um, so I can probably find um, time to write short stories a lot more than I can find time to write novels. I, some, at one point in time I was writing two books a year and I don't know how I did it. We'll see um, as time goes on. This, this book took me a lot longer than it should have. Um, and not because the book was a problem, because I'm really glad it was actually in this book, because this book I was really fascinated about from the, from the get-go. Um, but, you know, that's what happens when you work in the arts. Sometimes things work and sometimes they don't, and you just kind of plug along until something goes, okay, that's awesome, and then you can throw away the 300 pages that you wrote that were awful, and go on from there. But when Mercy has babies, am I going to do more Native traditions? I'm probably going to bring a few more Native things in there. That's actually... It leads into a different, a different thing I wanted to tell you all. You guys probably know, have heard that I've got a deal going with Amazon. <laughs> so, right, right, and I'm really excited about it because when I started out, I had a previous deal um, with a, a company that wanted to put this in production, and then several things happened. Um, 2007 had a big dip in the yeah, entertainment industry and things like that. And I'm really kind of glad it didn't happen then because I knew at that point I was going to have to fight really hard to get a native character, a native person to play Mercy. That it was going to be a, it, it was going to be something that I was going to have to fight to now. The cool thing about the Amazon deal is they wouldn't put it together until we found a native writer to attach the project. So super excited. And um, I talked to I, I talked to them um, already, and boy, they're awesome. And we're going to if this project goes together, and I don't know, it, that's up to Amazon at this point. They paid me money, they paid the producer money, they paid um, the writers, and then Ian Kenny is a showrunner. I found out what a showrunner does. <laughs> a showrunner does the overall story arc for the for every season. And the showrunners attached to this project is Anne Kinney, that you would probably know from Outlander. So, super excited. The people, the quality of the people that we have uh, attached to this, the production company that pushed this deal through is Gary Oldman and uh, Douglas Urbanski, or Urbanski, sorry, uh, who, is, who are Oscar winners, right? So, uh, it's Jake, I'm, I'm really hopeful that if we get this done, it's going to be awesome. So, um, cross your fingers with me. But we're going to make sure that the native traditions are in there correctly because the writers will all be native. So, super. So, am I going to expand upon Wolf and Stefan? Of course. Um, am I going to do a side bit, like do a side story on them? Probably not a novel, but maybe a short story or two or a ten. Um, there's so much. There's so much potential story in Wolf and Stefan yeah. and all of them. And by the way, I just want to make make clear to you, I have the way I pronounce their names. I don't care how you pronounce their names. As long as you feel like you're pronouncing their names correctly, it's correct. Um, Stefan would be how you say it if they if they were in Italy. Uh, he doesn't care if you say Stefan. He doesn't care if you say Stephen. He's fine with all of those. And Bran can be Bran. I say Bran. If he were Welsh, he'd say Bran. And he doesn't care if it's Bran or Bran. So be happy. Um, a seal doesn't care if it's a seal or however else you want to pronounce his name. As long as you think he's beautiful, he's fine with it. <laughs> okay, yes. Am I going to leave Stefan alone? Am I too mean? <laughs> 
Um, if I wanted to be nice to my characters, you would never want to read my books. <laughs> happy, happy characters don't make good books, but yeah, Stefan will, Stefan will come to a happier place. Right now, he and Ben have been tortured for quite a few books. Yeah. And I'll probably get a couple more books so you feel really sorry for him or do something nice. <laughs> Probably, you know, probably not. I mean, one thing about my books, and I'll promise you, is good will always win over evil. I really write these so that you will be in a better, better frame. If you start my books, I don't, I, 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 I'm happy to torment you and make you feel terrible and cry and get mad at me and whatever you want to all the way through the books. But at the end of the book, you should feel better than you did when you started the book. I think that's... Uh, I think that's what books do for me, and that's the kind of book I like to read, is the ones, I like books that make me think, um, I like books that don't tell me what to think, and that's what I try to write, right, is think books that make you think and don't, and don't tell you what to think, and, um, and also books that make you feel a little better about the world and, and yourself at the, at the end of the book. And if nothing else, you'll feel glad that you're not a protagonist in an urban fantasy series. <laughs> yeah. Do I get to approve the ideas that Amazon wants to do on the merchandise? I don't think so, but they would be really dumb to do stupid things. Okay, okay, okay. so. Okay, the question is, when did I first meet Mercy or the Mercy characters? I uh, wrote uh, Raven, uh, Raven, oh, come on. Raven Shadow and Raven Strike. Raven Shadow and Raven Strike, I sold, I, I sold as a two book deal. And, I checked my contracts very carefully after I finished Raven Shadow, and it did not have a due date for Raven Strike. And I thought that was really odd, but I couldn't find one. And I thought, huh, so I'm going to go back and I'm going to take masks, and I'm going to revise masks and get it ready to go back in. And I did, and that was the hardest thing I have ever done in my life because I was a completely different person than I was when I wrote masks. And I wrote masks started when I was like 25 and 26. And I know a lot more now, and I'm a much better writer now. And um, the book, uh, trying to keep the book be the, trying to keep the book the same, and fix all the things that were wrong with it made me crazy. And finally, I just added adjectives and setting, <laughs> and and backed off on that on that. But I was finishing up. I sent it in. They were happy with it. They were going to go with it. And then she said, "And so, how are you getting on the other book? The book that's due next week." And we thought that we would take all of those books of yours that have been out of print for years and years and years and bring them back in print um, in the months before we release the next Raven Strike. The months before we release Raven Strike, we've got that all set up. This book has to come out here, and these books come out this, 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 and be really good advertising for it. And I went, how long, how late can I deliver it? Because I was on page 50. <laughs> and I said, and then I went back and I looked at my contract, and you know what? Sometime between when I read my contract the first time and the second time, there was a darn due date on it. So um, I wrote Raven's Strike in five weeks. And I don't think I slept four hours a night that whole five weeks. And at some point in time, I remember Mike coming down, finding me sobbing in the basement, and he asked me what's wrong. And I'm going, I have. 13 people in there, or have six people, and there are horses going to this place, and I have too many characters. And he goes, Patty, sometimes a horse is just a horse. I go, thank you. And I went back. Um, so, um, so I got, to, you know, and I got that done, and I finished it, and I'm very proud of it. Um, uh, one, uh, during that five weeks, I took the last 100 pages and revised the whole 100 pages. I literally printed it out cut the scenes with a pair of scissors, struck it, stuck it across my basement, and, and, and taped it together in a better order so that it worked, and then rewrote it as 150 pages for the ending of the book. And I've never, I mean, that was incredibly difficult. It was, it was a lot of time, it was a lot of energy, and a lot of stress. Got it done, and I took to my husband, I'm not going to write again for a year. I just can't. And the next day, my editor, my, my editor at Penguin called, and she says, Hey, Patty, how are you? And I said, I'm just fine. And I was going, I was going to talk to you about the next book. And she said, me too. She goes, I know you read urban fantasy, because at that point in time, it was, um, uh, it was Jim Butcher, Charlene Harris, Laura King Hamilton. Um, I don't think Kim uh, Harrison was out yet. She came out before me, but I don't think she was out yet. I think it was those three and Kelly Armstrong. 
were out. And she said, we just lost a bidding war for an urban fantasy series, and my, ed my, my boss came to me and asked if any of our writers could write urban fantasy. And she said, Patty, I thought you could do that, because you love it. And I go, yes. And then I sat down and wrote 100 pages of Moon, of, uh, Moon Called that week. So that's what happened. And they gave me a really broad, this is the first time that, they, uh, that I ever had any direction from my, uh, first and only time I've ever had any direction before I wrote a book. Um, they wanted a, um, let's see, an urban fantasy with werewolves and vampires because they tried other things and they hadn't worked. Um, set it with a female protagonist uh, and who had a complicated love life, and that's how Mercy was. <laughs> Am I going to have more short stories to go more in depth into Brand's backstory? Of course, of course, and probably also in the within the book. You know, the, the, I'd like to bring out that, his backstory and, and let you know kind of who he is as I write the books. Yes. Is there going to be a story about Gary Laughing Dog and Honey getting together? Gary Laughing Dog is a Mercy's half brother. Um, I don't know where, how far we'll get it, but they are going to appear in the next book, the one I'm working on right now. Um, is actually kind of centered around Gary. So, yes. A rising tide floats all, boi uh, all boats. So did the twilight, the hyper on twilight help you or hurt you? Helped, absolutely helped. Just like Harry Potter helped everybody who wrote young adult. And, um, and uh, um, you know, good right, good, you know, good storytelling. What made urban fantasy work is two things. First of all, it was incredibly innovative and interesting when it first came out. Nobody ever thought of having creatures from horror films be heroes and heroines and basically superhero characters and have real lives and real personality until we started doing this. And it's not, I mean, it goes, it goes back. Fred Saberhagen did um, the Dracula tapes back in the early 80s, I think, and they were fantastic. Tanya Huff, 10 years before, um, before Buffy, Tanya Huff wrote uh, Blood Ties and, uh, and those, which were amazing. I told Tanya when I saw her, I go, what are you writing now? So I know what to write in 10 years. <laughs> so and I'm not sure if she appreciated it as much as I did. <laughs> um, and if you haven't read them, go read them. They're amazing. Um, but they really, when they really hit, these are the storytellers we had in the book world. We had Laurel K. Hamilton, who is the best scene writer on the planet. She can grab you by the throat and drag you through a scene, and, and you can't stop. Put, you can, even if the scene's 100 pages long, you can't put it down until it's done, and you stop, and you're sweating. She's amazing. And we had Jim Butcher, who is Harry Dresden, is just awesome. I mean, he's, he's just an awesome storyteller. And Charlene Harris, who, who can really spin a really fantastic yarn, and she's an awesome person, too. Um, uh, but... So, people would go and they would say, this is an interesting idea, and they get an interesting idea told by a master storyteller. And as long as that was true for urban fantasy, and it stayed true for quite a while in urban fantasy, people went, oh, I love urban fantasy. And really what they meant was, oh, I love good stories. <laughs> um, what happened to, uh, I'm really grateful that we've had this long of a run, and it's still, kind of, it's still kind of going, it's not going the way it was, but it's still kind of going good, because we have this, um, cohort of really good writers in the genre. I can remember when horror came out, when Stephen King built a horror genre. Stephen King and Peter Straub and um, Dean Koontz and all of those all started writing about the same time. And everybody read horror. And then they got a whole plethora of bad writers. And it killed the genre. Just dead. And um, Stephen King, uh, Peter Cook, not Peter Cook, it's not. Um, Stephen King, uh, Peter Straub, thank you. Um, Dean Coates, they can still sell books. Um, I have a feeling that Peter Straub is not writing anymore. Anyway, uh, but, but um, the genre itself is kind of dead. And it comes back and it dies, and it comes back and it dies. So um, I'm really grateful to y'all for picking up Urban Fantasy because that's my favorite genre to read as well as to write in. And uh, let's hope that we can keep it going for that. Um, I think that, oh, comfort reads for me, um, anything by Lois McMaster Bujold. I love them. I love her fantasy. I love her science fiction. Um, um, Norm Roberts' uh, uh, in-death series is a real comfort read because I just love her characters. Yeah. Yeah. They're so much fun. Um, and I can pick up any of them and keep reading. Uh, Jim Butcher, um, Charlene Harris, Lorkey Hamilton, 
you know, those are those are those are the people I go back to that I know I'm gonna pick it up. I'm gonna um Maggie Stiefvater. Um right? Uh let me think. Who else do I love? Yeah. Sunshine. Oh, uh Rob McKinley Robin McKin Robin McKinley. Yeah, anything Rob McKinley writes is amazing. Yeah. Um I I have uh, I've been re reading her since she wrote the Blue Sword and it came out and I love the cover and picked it up and it's on horses anyway <laughs> so people thank you so much this has been so much fun I'm going to uh, turn this back over to Stephen okay and we're going to set up and start signing so that we can get you all home tonight the book that she was there to sign is of course Soul Taken brand new Mercy Thompson novels yes this is her sitting on my shelf. This is a parallel story, different main characters, same universe, and here is my signature on the book that I went to go and get signed. Also got a different hardback sign, Shifting Shadows, which is typically the book that I have right here. I'm not quite sure where to place this one yet. I have the room. Let's see if I find, let's find out if I have the room. Part of the problem is these two books, which I also take to get signed, because even though this is the second book in this duology, uh, it is actually the first book by Patricia Briggs that I ever went and had read. These also have the coyote on her signature, so that's, that's kind of interesting, even though coyote has absolutely nothing to do with this duology. They go there. Right next to them is the Alpha and Omega series. With Mercy Thompson, ooh, just barely enough room. <laughs> Yay, it fits. So yes, that is the full vlog experience. My Patricia Briggs signing. I had an absolute blast and Patricia Briggs was very, very sweet. Oh, I know. If she ever comes back, I will definitely be going to another book signing of hers. A new video that is coming to my channel soon is my bookish backgrounds where I tell you what all of the books are about, how I got into her, what some of my favorite things about Patricia Briggs is, and just absolutely loving on this author who is my only official auto buy author. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and feel free to subscribe to my channel if you have not done so already. I will post another video next Wednesday. Until then, have a wicked day.